I don't really have a, a paper with this title. I'm actually in the process of writing a book on the evolution of law. Um, and what I hope to do today is give you an idea of the theoretical basis uh, for my view of legal evolution, along with some brief selective discussion of some of the implications of this process uh, and the institutions that tend to evolve. Uh, before that, uh, though, I think I do need to quickly tell you what I mean by law, uh, the, uh, because there are different definitions, and if you have one in mind that's different than mine, my presentation won't make much sense. Um, uh, Lon Fuller wrote that law consists in the enterprise of subjecting human conduct to the governance of rules. Uh, and I take this to mean that law is not just a set of rules, uh, rather it consists of, of if you want to use uh, Hart's uh, terms, uh, the basic or primary rules of, of conduct, along with secondary uh, institutions or mechanisms for applying these rules. And uh, this is the view that I'm going to adopt here. Uh, it's certainly not the only definition uh, that exists. Uh, I suppose the main alternative is, is uh, John Austin's uh, definition, uh, law is the command of the sovereign, or perhaps uh, more generally, uh, command uh, from the apparatus of the state. Um, labeling state-made rules and, and law as, uh, or institutions as law and everything else is not law is simplifies things a lot. Uh, but I think it uh, uh, leaves a lot of things outside the discussion that are very important parts of the governance process. Uh, it, in fact, it leaves out things like primitive so-called stateless societies. Um, it leaves out many of the med early medieval societies, for instance, Iceland that David has written about. Uh, leads out most international trade today, um, and so on. So um, I uh, have a definition or a, adopt a definition that is much broader, that uh, in general considers any system of governance or not any, but uh, uh, systems of governance uh, as legal systems uh, and recognize that they may or may not be related to the state. Um, okay, so the first point now, given that definition that I want to make about the uh, evolution of law and legal institutions uh, is that uh, we should be thinking about law in the same way that we think about economic institutions. In fact, law is an economic institution, uh, I think. Uh, it evolves very much like markets can evolve, um, it, uh, or it can evolve that way. Um, in fact, what I'm going to uh, do is uh, suggest that a positive analysis of the evolution of law should be based on the fundamental assumptions that drive all of economic theory. Uh, scarcity, uh, methodological individualism, and uh, rationality. Uh, first, scarcity. Uh, David Hume pointed out almost two and a half centuries ago, I guess now, uh, that uh, a primary or maybe the primary motivation for developing rules and in institutions, whether spontaneously or deliberately, is that rational individuals are attempting to find ways to expand personal wealth in the face of scarcity, uh, just, uh, just like markets then. Um, but uh, importantly, I think we have to recognize that are, there are two ways for individuals to expand wealth, personal wealth. Uh, one is what Franz Oppenheimer has labeled the economic means, uh, cooperative, voluntary interaction, team production, division of labor, all those things we're all familiar with in uh, economics, voluntary exchange. The second involves the taking of wealth produced by others through the use of force or guile. Um, and Oppenheimer calls this the political means, so I'll, I'll use his terms. Um, my point then is that a positive analysis of legal evolution should uh, simultaneously account for the influences of the rules and institutions which facilitate the economic means of wealth 
expansion uh, or enhancement for individuals. And those uh, law, rules and institutions that are part of the political process of wealth transfer. Um, and I, I think this view is at least somewhat different uh, from uh, at some of the earlier uh, work in law and economics that approached the uh, evolution of law uh, from the point of view of uh, efficiency, suggesting that uh, at least the common law was a an efficiently evolving institution. Um, on the other hand, it's uh, somewhat different than the uh, rent-seeking literature in public choice that views everything as uh, uh, all rules and, and things as evolving in response to uh, transfer-seeking or rent-seeking. Uh, because my contention is that both of these things are going on and uh, so we have this schizophrenic system that uh, is simultaneously uh, defining crime and, and uh, creating crime and so on. Um, most people find themselves involved in both types of uh, activity under different circumstances. Uh, we are often uh, subject to different sets of rules and institutions under different circumstances. In other words, we're part of, of simultaneously perhaps of more than one system of law. Uh, the evolution of law is a process of continual interaction uh, and competition uh, and uh, in influence uh, going in both directions. Uh, so uh, what I want to do is give you some idea of how I'm beginning to think about this evolutionary process. Um, and in order to do that, I'm going to uh, first look at the two extremes of the, this continuum uh, between uh, cooperation and coercion or between the economic means and the political means. Uh, first start about, uh, s spend some time talking about uh, cooperative institutions and how they might evolve, uh, then uh, shift to the other extreme of uh, coercive or political institutions, and then hopefully I won't run out of time and I can talk about the interaction between the two uh, for a, a few minutes as well. Um, in order to illustrate the process of legal institutions and some of its consequences, I want to uh, begin with the uh, Hobbesian state of nature, where many of us begin when we think about these things. Um, where there's no cooperative interaction at all, uh, obviously uh, not uh, something we've ever s observed uh, completely, but uh, let's start there. Um, I will assume that there is considerable uncertainty and therefore high transactions costs, uh, dis but I'm not assuming some sort of Rawlsian veil of ignorance or, or something like that. I'm assuming that uh, uh, individuals are rational, they have some expectations about all uh, the consequence of alternative actions and so on. Uh, because of scarcity, competition over the use of property it is inevitable, as Hume pointed out. Uh, how do we uh, make crop property claims? Well, uh, the standard view is that individuals all act unilaterally uh, by uh, investing in uh, efforts at, at violence in order to make threats against other people or actually uh, uh, violent actions against other people in an effort to uh, make property claims. Since several individuals are likely to have similar incentives for uh, a particular uh, scarce resource, competition through violence uh, supposedly occurs. We have uh, the war of all against all. Uh, and uh, the winner I guess uh, has relatively secure property rights for a while until somebody else comes along. Uh, the uh, argument I want to make first is that this war of all against all is not an inevitable characteristic of the state of nature, uh, as Hume pointed out. Um, competition for scarce resources is multi-sided and any subset of individuals might be able to reduce the cost of conflict by voluntarily uh, recognizing some set, subset of each other's claims uh, and uh, ending the conflict uh, so they don't have to invest so much in violence. Um, interesting uh, set of papers uh, have been produced over the last few years developing uh, one-shot uh, games 
uh, in this competition conflict power area. Uh, and uh, uh, surprisingly, uh, that perhaps they, in they predict a continuum of output uh, outcomes, of course, but ranging from full cooperation to partial cooperation to conflict. And the difference between these games and the standard uh, prisoner's dilemma game, perhaps, is the recognition that people may have different capacities for violence uh, and therefore uh, relative capacities for production. Uh, full cooperation, this, these uh, models suggest, uh, arise when neither person's investments in violence um, are expected to change the probability of winning very much. In other words, the, uh, uh, the marginal product of investing in conflict is very low. Uh, so a large differential investment for violence produces only a small change in the probability and the incentives then are to tacitly cooperate. Uh, and the result in, in these uh, models is a private property arrangement in which uh, no party attempts to claim resources controlled by the others. Um, the conflict strategy or outcome uh, dominates when the marginal product of violence is expected to be high for both parties. Each believes that increasing investments in, in violence uh, will enhance their probability of winning, and you have the typical prisoner's dilemma, uh, and you end up then with the war of all against all. Uh, and the third uh, sort of broad uh, category of outcomes is partial cooperation, where one party's opportunity cost of investing in conflict differs substantially from the other parties. And so one individual invests in violence and the other one doesn't, and you get the command uh, arrangement or uh, what I like to call uh, uh, the uh, protection racket or uh, something like that, where uh, one individual uh, subjugates and extracts tribute uh, from another. Uh, so one individual produces wealth and the other one uh, produces violence and, and extracts wealth. Um, the uh, Oppenheimer concept of the political means of wealth expansion uh, of this tribute or extortion or whatever you want to call it obviously ap applies. Now in a dynamic setting uh, things aren't obviously quite this simple but I think this is a good starting point for thinking about a dynamic uh, or evolutionary process. Um, the Potential static outcomes of cooperation, conflict, and, and partial cooperation are, are sort of the, uh, the starting points. Uh, in a dynamic setting, the probability of the conflict outcome may, might be reduced, for instance, uh, as uh, we move into the potential for repeated game uh, reciprocities, uh, increasing the likelihood of a cooperative outcome, uh, although repeated games obviously don't guarantee cooperation. Uh, other incentives to cooperate uh, I'll explore shortly, but the point is that uh, in uh, a, uh, when people have a little bit longer time horizons, uh, when reputations matter, that sort of thing, uh, then the potential for agreements uh, expands. But importantly, the initial agreement still has to ration to each individual as much wealth as he uh, or she would expect to have through the use of force. Uh, so uh, force determines the initial distribution of wealth even when it's uh, achieved voluntarily, essentially, in this framework. Uh, might makes right. Uh, the degree to which individuals reduce their investment in violence uh, after an agreement depends on how credible each other's promises are. Uh, and, and on the source of the credibility. If, if the agreement stems from an initial situation involving uh, asymmetric capacities for violence, then the dominant power can demand a relatively large share of property rights and wealth. Um, in, in fact, if, if we think of an, someone with an absolute advantage in violence, then the outcome is something like slavery, where the uh, one individual owns uh, everything, including uh, the labor time of the other individual. Um, but uh, in this case, of course, the uh, 
uh, source of credibility of the promise of the slave is, is fear, and so in order to maintain credibility on the part of the slave, uh, the investment in violence has to continue. Uh, and uh, so accepting slavery, after all, uh, one, uh, the choices aren't very attractive, die or, or be a slave, but if you become a slave, there might be some possibility of escaping later, and so uh, the uh, slave owner has to uh, continue to invest in violence uh, or the tools of violence to maintain that arrangement. Um, when no one has a comparative advantage in violence, then individuals can contract uh, to recognize some initial distribution of private property rights. Uh, the uh, Incentives to cooperate in this case are, are generally positive. Individuals enter because they expect to increase their personal wealth by being able to focus more of their resources on, on production and less on uh, perhaps on violence. Uh, in uh, a dynamic, uncertain world, the resulting property rights arrangements still require the support of institutions, and I'll talk briefly about that shortly. But uh, under this uh, circumstance, uh, the institutions that evolve uh, will uh, tend to uh, provide uh, sources of information and, and increase credibility for promises uh, without the use of violence. Uh, between those extremes of slavery and, and full cooperation, we have uh, a whole range of possibilities. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, a, a person, a very productive person, might choose to pay tribute or extortion uh, simply because even, even though that individual might be able to uh, resist uh, effectively if the opportunity cost of resisting is, is uh, greater than the uh, cost of the extortion, uh, which means the extortionist is constrained clearly in how much uh, that can be extracted. Um, so I visualize a continuum of possible systems naturally evolving under different circumstances, uh, and law and the resulting behavior varies as a result. Um, let's, uh, let me think a little bit about the, the laws uh, that might evolve in, uh, a, uh, in a cooperative arrangement first. Uh, Van Berg and, and Buchanan define trust rules to be rules of behavior toward others which individuals have positive incentives to voluntarily accept. And they explain that these incentives are uh, uh, associated with such rules are, are the basis for voluntary group formation. Uh, individuals uh, uh, es essentially agree to behave in certain ways with other individuals and then you get a network of such relationships uh, creating a, some sort of uh, a network of group interaction based on these bilateral uh, agreements. Uh, assuming trust rules are voluntarily recognized, the outcome uh, is some sort of implicit or explicit contract uh, where individuals agree to adopt predictable uh, behavioral patterns or norms in dealing with other individuals. Uh, the uh, one party who adopts uh, cooperative behavior has to believe the other party is trustworthy, of course. Uh, so the, there has to be a, a belief that uh, promises are credible. That belief initially may reflect uh, each other's uh, similar capacities for violence or something like that. Uh, since the initial conflict tends to be uh, due to scarcity, uh, the uh, development of cooperation is a, and establishing trust rules uh, will focus on the allocation of property rights, I would argue. Uh, security of each individual's property claims incre uh, will be increased by adopting trust rules, respect uh, property rights of others uh, who are in your cooperative cluster. Um, and they do so because others uh, are expected to cooperate as well. Um, with this kind of cooperation, property rights become rel relatively more private, relatively more secure. Individuals' time horizons are lengthened and all those good things that we think about with private property rights. Uh, the, uh, importantly, these trust rules regard recognition of private property then, and uh, they are customary rules or norms initially uh, 
which evolve spontaneously through voluntary interaction. Uh, Robert Ellickson uh, had a paper in uh, Yale Law Journal in 1993 uh, where he pointed out that there is abundant evidence that a group need not make conscious decisions to establish private property rights. People uh, who repeatedly interact can generate institu institutions through communication, monitoring, and sanctioning. Contrary to Hobbes and Locke, a property system can get going without an initial conclave. Um, and he provides a, a good deal of interesting evidence to that effect. Um, how does such evolution occur? Well, um, I, I mentioned uh, repeated game reciprocities. That's certainly part of the story. Um, the, uh, um, furthermore, once a group starts forming, uh, even in a primitive setting, there will generally be a, a network of interactions uh, on many dimensions, uh, essentially everyone is in a community uh, where you, your relationships are direct and multi-sided. And so with a, a multi-functioning web of cooperation, uh, the incentives to cooperate uh, uh, are strengthened uh, because of potential reputation sanctions. Uh, if you don't cooperate, uh, then it's possible that uh, the other person can uh, spread negative gossip, if you want to call it that, and uh, the uh, consequences on reputation can limit the non-cooperative player's ability to enter into other games. Uh, there's little doubt that such information will travel, and in fact, an important development often in these uh, systems is the development of institutions to spread information about reputation. Um, these uh, come very quickly, uh, and I would suggest that uh, this is how uh, individuals spontaneously end up producing ostracism sanctions. Uh, you spread information about uh, uh, non-cooperative behavior on the part of others. Others choose not to uh, cooperate with the uh, non-cooperative player too, and pretty quick you can't find anyone to deal with. So uh, importantly then, other sanctions start developing. Uh, Nonviolent forms of sanctions can develop in these uh, arrangements where you can reduce your, uh, your investment in violence uh, as a uh, source of credible commitments uh, and perhaps increase your investments in uh, information mechanisms uh, and that sort of thing as a substitute, uh, a low-cost substitute uh, in general. Uh, information, especially in a close-knit group, is cheap to send and cheap to obtain, so it's probably a much lower cost uh, uh, mechanism of sanctioning and uh, less dangerous for the individual, you have uh, social ostracism substituting for uh, violence. So what I'm imagining then is an evolutionary process in which individuals gradually emerge from the state of nature as they recognize the high cost of violence as a mean of, means of establishing property rights. <coughs> they, they face the likelihood of repeated interactions with certain uh, neighbors with similar capacities for violence, uh, relatively tentative bilateral relationships uh, based on reciprocity incentives uh, arise. Uh, each bilateral repeated game uh, uh, involves probably tit-for-tat kinds of strategies or something like that. Uh, but as more relationships are formed, the potential for uh, rest, um, reputation sanctions arise, um, exit options arise, which make uh, reputation sanctions stronger because if you've got a lot of different intermeshing relationships, there's often a competitive alternative uh, to the person you were dealing with who becomes non-cooperative, so you simply refuse to deal with the individual anymore and, and announce to your group that he, uh, uh, he's a bad guy. And uh, so you end up with unconditional cooperation, essentially, uh, but uh, it's limited to those people who are, are known to be cooperative. And uh, it's a, a, a voluntary kind of arrangement, not unlike many primitive societies. Um, Van Berg and Buchanan explain that once a group is voluntarily formed, the uh, 
ba uh, based on trust rules, the possibility exists for establishing other kinds of rules uh, that they define as solidarity rules. And these are rules uh, targeted at the entire group rather than uh, bilateral rules between individuals. Uh, the uh, solidarity rules, I suppose, are things like do not behave recklessly uh, to put other people at risk. Uh, but they can also involve rules about individuals' obligations to cooperate in the production of rule enforcement. Uh, rules like inform your neighbors about individuals who violate trust rules. Don't cooperate with individuals who are uncooperative with other people. Uh, these are solidarity rules in a sense, but uh, again, I would argue they uh, evolve spontaneously uh, as individuals uh, recognize the benefit of, of accepting them. Um, the, uh, uh, so as ostracism does, for instance. And uh, they uh, typically, if we look at the evidence, uh, we see uh, things like inform uh, your neighbors uh, when individuals violate trust rules uh, are clearly uh, at place, but they go beyond that. They include watch out for your neighbors. They include uh, 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 respond to the, uh, the hue and cry, uh, if we go back to Anglo-Saxon England, when a theft has occurred, and uh, help your neighbor pursue the thief. Um, the empirical fact is that one uh, joint product of these cooperative clusters generally is uh, uh, cooperation in the policing function. Um, other solidarity rules. Uh, arise as well. Uh, of course, um, a lot of people say, well, with these kinds of solidarity rules, we're talking about public goods, uh, and uh, so you got obvious free rider problems. But uh, in these close-knit groups, uh, in general, if you don't follow the solidarity rule, you're ostracized too. So uh, people are excluded if they don't uh, obey these rules, and uh, uh, so we don't have the public good free rider problem. Um, now, I, my, uh, I might be creating the impression that threats and sanctions are the primary source of incentives to recognize rules uh, involving, uh, in, in these evolving cooperative groups. Uh, that's clearly not the case. Uh, ostracism is a, uh, is a threat, obviously, uh, that substitutes for uh, violence. But there are all sorts of very significant positive incentives to uh, recognize uh, cooperative uh, trust and solidarity rules. Um, and uh, in fact, um, I'm not going to have time to talk about it, but um, a number of other institutions clearly arise in these systems in order to, uh, for instance, when circumstances change, to try to uh, create incentives for people to continue to accept the rules. Uh, for instance, uh, hard times arise for someone due to floods or fires or something like that. These systems typically have insurance, uh, mutual insurance kinds of arrangements where you help out your neighbor under those circumstances because if you don't, the neighbor's incentives to re uh, respect your property right clearly are undermined. Uh, they want to stay alive, so they might have to turn to theft. Uh, one way to avoid that is to insure against it through these kinds of mutual ins insurance arrangements. Uh, another uh, thing that uh, always arises, uh, obviously, uh, uh, there will be disputes as to whether someone is actually guilty of committing uh, a uh, breaking a trust rule. And uh, uh, these, uh, uh, we could have prosecution through violence. Uh, to decide guilt, but that has significant spillover effects for the rest of the community. So in general, we see uh, nonviolent third-party dispute resolution mechanisms arising, uh, some sort of arbitration or mediation. Uh, Gordon talked about trial by ordeal. Uh, one way to think about that, of course, was that uh, <coughs> the chosen arbitrator was God. And uh, if the person survived the ordeal, uh, God saved them and, and said they were innocent. Uh, if you trust God, then they, that's a pretty good third party. Um, and so uh, these kinds of third party mechanisms develop uh, as well. Um, what we have then is a system of evolving norms and evolving institutions to support those norms. 
Um, at some point, uh, as society gets more and more complex, those norms might be written down. Uh, but it's not the writing down of the norms that makes them law. Of course, it's the acceptance of, of the norms. Um, uh, what I'm talking about then is, a, is essentially a customary law system. Um, well, I better turn to the uh, other end if I'm going to have any time to talk about the middle. So let me uh, uh, go to uh, the other extreme where an individual has a significant comparative advantage in violence and chooses instead of cooperation to take wealth produced by others. Um, the uh, Oppenheimer's political means of, of wealth expansion. Um, the uh, individual with a, such a comparative advantage may expect to be better off by taking other people's wealth than, than uh, he can become by cooperating, producing, trading, and so on. Um, given that information spreads, the individual who employs this comparative advantage is going to develop a reputation too uh, uh, for uh, taking wealth. Uh, and such reputations uh, can, in fact, be quite valuable. Uh, as uh, increasingly the threat of violence alone might be sufficient to extort uh, payments. Uh, once the reputation develops, however, the potential for entering cooperative relationships with other people have uh, pretty much been uh, cut off. And so uh, a decision to employ violence in order to take wealth oftentimes involves a permanent commitment to uh, extortionist behavior. Uh, you're not going to be able to uh, change uh, down the road because no one will trust you. Uh, so among other things, that means that the extortionist has incentives to uh, create an environment that will produce a steady a stream of transfers from sub subjects uh, of threat rather than uh, just going out raiding and taking and then finding somebody else to raid. That can work for a while, but ultimately you might run out of people to raid. So you might instead choose to establish institutions that allow people to continue to produce and to uh, extort money from them uh, or income from them. Um, this means, of course, that the extortionist has to attempt, at least, to establish a monopoly in violence. Uh, some people define uh, states as monopolists in violence, and, and uh, I wouldn't disagree at least uh, that they have attempted to do so. Um, the, if the potential target for extortion can turn to another specialist in violence uh, for protection, or if the potential target can turn to a cooperative group that joint, jointly produces protection, then the extortionist's ability to extract tribute is limited. Uh, so uh, the incentive is to try to monopolize violence and cr uh, uh, raise barriers to exit. Uh, try to keep people from escaping uh, the system. Uh, no individual, of course, is likely to be powerful enough to uh, establish a permanent, undisputed monopoly in violence. Uh, there's going to be competition, uh, perhaps from other individuals who also want that monopoly. Uh, the uh, transaction costs of Control mean that some interaction between individuals and some wealth will remain outside even the most powerful extortionist control. Uh, but the extortionists, my point is that they have uh, incentives to try to uh, control these margins where people are, are attempting to escape them. Uh, they have to try to erect barriers to exit, exit from this extortionist kind of game. Uh, there are a number of institutional developments that can help in that regard. Um, one possible institution would be an alliance or collusion among potentially uh, competing extortionists, recognizing each other's domains. Um, such an, an alliance, of course, is probably not very stable because none of the parties uh, trust each other. They all have reputations for being extortionists, so uh, it might not be a stable kind of thing. Um, the scale of violence required to compete for and maintain power is generally greater than any individual can produce, so uh, typically they, uh, the potential uh, entrepreneur in extortion will uh, establish a firm of some sort with, uh, to jointly produce violence. 
others who have comparative advantages but aren't uh, so entrepreneurial become the strong arm enforcers or the army or the police or whatever you want to call them. Uh, or the uh, military industrial complex, the producer of the tools of violence, that sort of thing. Uh, in return for cooperating with the extortionist, uh, of course, they receive part of the transfers. Um, and uh, that cooperative arrangement also requires credibility of promises. Uh, within the extortionist firm, I guess uh, you need to have honor among thieves. Um, historically, many examples of organizations like this uh, have evolved uh, where you have some sort of entrepreneurial leader who uh, convinces uh, perhaps people in one of these voluntary organizations that I talked about before that the way for them to expand their wealth is to go out to raid. Uh, I mean, tribal war chiefs were, uh, became kings. Uh, and uh, so uh, we, we do see these kinds of institutions evolving. Once they have raided and successfully conquered, uh, then the traditional cooperative legal arrangements within the group uh, won't suffice because you're uh, obviously, uh, you're, you want to discriminate now between those you conquered and those who are conquering, and uh, you have to transfer wealth and so on, so you need a, uh, a centralized uh, command kind of uh, legal arrangement to force uh, uh, people to accept the, uh, the transfer of wealth from the conquered to the conquerors. Um, the uh, the um, uh, organization uh, for for conquest and for uh, extortion um, has to uh, be maintained by the entrepreneur, of course. And uh, uh, this could be a problem. Oftentimes, uh, you have uh, coups and, and so on by the, uh, the military or the police. Um, so there are incentives to, uh, to uh, keep the evolving military policing organization decentralized and competing among uh, one another rather than uh, uh, centralized and collusive uh, because uh, you want to uh, prevent competition from your own organization for power. Um, the, uh, another uh, way to uh, secure a position like this uh, relatively, of course, is to um, try to reduce the incentives of other individuals and groups uh, to enter competition for uh, the uh, monopoly and violence. And one way to do that is to um, offer uh, exchange with other potentially powerful individuals uh, part of the wealth that's being transferred in exchange for uh, not entering the game, essentially. Uh, and as a result, the uh, the protection racket can involve a mix of rules supporting extortion of the weak and protecting the relatively powerful uh, in uh, exchange for them not entering the game. Um, if, uh, uh, if you think this is all made up, uh, read uh, Gambetta's uh, book, 1993 book on the Sicilian Mafia, a uh, great book for public choice economists. Um, the Mafia simultaneously extorts wealth and supports its production by enforcing contracts and uh, protecting property rights of, of people within its uh, circle of in, uh, influence. Uh, uh, the same is true of most other protection rackets, uh, things we call kingdoms and nation states and things like that. Um, in order to maintain power, the extortionist also has incentives to redistribute wealth as the relative power of, of, of subgroups within his sphere, a sphere of influence uh, begin to change. Um, redistribution involves uh, uh, or requires gathering information uh, and uh, uh, learning about uh, who's becoming powerful and in influential, that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, the incentive uh, there is to develop institutions uh, to channel this, uh, this competition for transfers. Uh, we see the development of uh, advisory panels, um, 
that sort of thing, uh, advisory councils, representative assemblies, and so on, where the, uh, uh, the monitoring uh, of uh, various groups can be uh, observed and the, uh, their competition for transfers can be uh, uh, channeled. Of course, again, keep them divided uh, and competing uh, makes it hard, uh, less likely that they'll collude and take over. Um, as relative power changes, the amount of representation in these councils or assemblies can change. The franchise can be expanded or contracted uh, for new groups. There may be some transfer to the poor if you think the poor is, are, uh, are likely to rise up in revolt. But in a relative sense, compared to, uh, for instance, the voluntary uh, insurance arrangements I talked about for the cooperative groups, uh, the transfers are from the poor to the wealthy or, or from uh, less powerful groups to more powerful groups. Uh, and uh, so we, we see the evolution then of legal institutions uh, focused on transfer processes. Um, the, uh, at any point in time, the extortionist uh, ru ruler is clearly constrained in regard to how much can be transferred. Uh, after all, some wealth has to be produced if it's going to be transferred. And so uh, private property rights create the strongest possible incentives for long-run wealth creation, and it follows that some private property rights will be maintained uh, even uh, for the most uh, uh, significant victims of the extortion, probably. That means five minutes? Five minutes. All right, good. Uh, slavery... Uh, with all property rights, including those to a person assigned to the extortionist, uh, is a very costly uh, ma uh, system to maintain. It might not survive. Uh, essentially, the extortionist faces a trade-off. Uh, large levels of extortion in the short term, including widespread slavery perhaps, reduces productivity and wealth creation and the potential for transfers over the long run. Uh, so the actual degree of transfers in any period depend on, on the extortionist time horizon. Uh, if, uh, if he uh, thinks uh, his uh, hold on power is very tenuous, his incentives are to take a bunch now uh, and get out of there. If he thinks his uh, power is uh, significant, then the incentives are to establish a, a system that allows for long-term uh, wealth creation, uh, at least more of it. And, uh, of course, that creates incentives for those uh, being extorted to actually uh, try to lengthen his time horizon. Uh, so you recognize a, a, uh, a dynasty, a king, uh, and his successors trying to lengthen the time horizon of the individual uh, making decisions, because the more uh, you, you can do that, the, uh, perhaps the greater the property rights uh, will be. Uh, but property rights remain in play in such a system. They can always be taken. Um, the uh, losers uh, then have conflicting incentives to try to escape, but also to recognize the, uh, the power and, and lengthen the time horizon. Um, the, let me uh, quickly here turn to uh, some discussion of the uh, interplay between these uh, incentives, because obviously we uh, don't have uh, either one in the extreme very often. Um, in some cases, the uh, rise of uh, extortion authority has been resisted quite effectively. Uh, even within modern developed nations, there are enclaves uh, that either don't need uh, or actively avoid contact with the national legal system. I would recommend uh, Lisa Bernstein's paper, uh, 1992, in the Journal of Legal Studies on the diamond uh, industry, for instance, uh, a great paper, or uh, Hernando de Soto's uh, 1989 book detailing the uh, uh, informal sector in, in Peru, and, or uh, Robert Ellickson's book on, uh, uh, what is it, uh, Order Without Law, but he defines law different than, than I do. A uh, number of uh, papers of that kind, uh, or books, uh, detailing uh, these uh, arrangements that are outside the state's law but quite effective at uh, uh, enforcing rules. Um, 
the, uh, to the degree that the extortionist is successful in uh, preventing exit from the extortion game, uh, competitive op options are reduced. Uh, it may be, for instance, that the uh, alternatives uh, can't use ostracism uh, effectively. Uh, because of state rules, they have to move their arrangements underground, so to speak, and they're forced to use more violence uh, as a result. Uh, certainly the informal sector in Peru, violence is the main mechanism uh, for uh, uh, the main sanction. Uh, you, uh, if you can't, uh, if you can't uh, ostracize, if you can't uh, force uh, restitution payments of some sort, uh, if you can't take someone else's property as restitution for a, a violation, then you might have to turn to violence as the only option that's left. Uh, so we see then uh, an interaction between these systems, one influencing the other, certainly uh, in terms of uh, the, the extortionist system. Oftentimes, as I said, they do enforce private property rights to a degree, and many of the uh, the laws that are codified are simply codified norms, uh, customary law that the state has copied down because they've been uh, successful, uh, but they often, of course, also add a few extra rules about uh, distribution of wealth and so on. Um, so what we have then is, a, is an environment uh, that is, uh, involves continual conflict between these incentives to take and to cooperate. Uh, rules evolve uh, in, in reflection of this continual interplay, uh, and institutions do as well. And that's, uh, I have about uh, 1,500 pages uh, describing all of that. Uh, I don't have time to do it now, so I'll stop.